Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the 2015 AERA Presidential Address entitled Morally Engaged Researchers Dismantling Epistemological Annihilation in the Age of Impunity. Before beginning introductory remarks for our president, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the many people who made this possible. The old, the old saying is that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village and then some to pull off an AERA annual meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and this year is no exception. We have an extraordinary program, including representation from the Smithsonian, Congress, and the White House, a youth research festival, as well as a diversity of sessions from law, filmmaking, the NBA, uh, and environmental, ecological sustainability, to community engagement, activism, the human condition, labor, etc., all situated around our theme toward justice. I would like to thank the AERA staff, Felice and Lori and Kimberly and John and Sylvie and Tony and George and Elliot and all the other folks behind the scenes for their help and support. They make this look easy and trust me, it is not. So thank you. I'd like to thank my graduate assistant and doctoral advisee, Alyssa Elmore, who worked tirelessly communicating with many of you for presidential sessions, as well as assisting me in other countless and sometimes thankless tasks. I'd also like to extend a shout out to my department chair, Eric Anderman, who was extremely understanding and supportive of my role as this year's program chair. Although my family isn't here, I want to thank them for my life and for the sacrifices and the floors they scrubbed so I could stand here before you. And I'd like to thank my son for his support all those years when he couldn't come with mommy to AERA. And finally, a heartfelt thank you, for those of you who know, to Herbert Klebard for everything. And now for our speaker. Professor Joyce Elaine King is an internationally distinguished scholar and researcher. <clears throat> Joyce grew up in Stockton, California, a Central Valley child from very humble beginnings, the second of three children and the only daughter of Lewis and Mabel King, Joyce's talents appeared at a very young age. In 1959, as a child, she made her film debut in the movie Porgy and Bess, that's right, with Sidney Poitier and Dorothy Danwich and Pearl Bailey and Sam Davis Jr. and Brock Peters and Diane Carroll. She was one of the children in the picnic day scenes on Kittigua Island that, in, in reality, were filmed in Stockton. She graduated from Edison High School in the spring of 1965, having won the title of Miss Bronze in Sacramento. During that summer, before she began her academic journey at Stanford University, she had to work in the fields picking onions with the task of filling 50-pound bags. Yet this future president of AERA even then was resourceful and had a plan. <laughs> Joyce and her cousin filled the bag half full of soil and then put the onions on top, <laughs> which worked uh, until um, the foreman rested his foot on the bag and which toppled over revealing said plan. Needless to say, Joyce and her cousin made a graceful but hasty retreat, uh, ne'er again to engage in that kind of field work. I, I, I. Arriving at Stanford that fall, she was privileged to study sociology in those undergraduate years with the eminent scholar St. Clair Drake. She went on to finish her doctoral work at Stanford in 1974 and in 2002 received a certificate from the Harvard Graduate School Institute of Educational Management. 
Joyce has received numerous fellowships, including the American Council on Education's National Fellowship, a W.K. Kellogg National Leadership Fellowship, and the National Institutes of Mental Health Postdoctoral Fellowship. Her other academic honors include a distinguished lecturer at the University of South Carolina, a distinguished fellowship award for research and leadership in critical studies at the University of Auckland, a visiting research fellow <coughs> at the Southern Education Foundation, a Bush Hewlett Foundation fellow at Harvard University, etc. Joyce has extensive administrative experience. She currently holds the Benjamin E. Mays Endowed Chair of Urban Teaching, Learning, and Leadership at Georgia State University. In addition, she served as a professor as well as a provost and chief academic officer at Spelman College, associate provost at Medgar Evers College in the CUNY system, and associate vice chancellor for academic affairs and diversity programs at the University of New Orleans, among other administrative roles. She has also been a visiting professor at the Federal University of Sao Carlos in Brazil. Joyce has engaged in numerous organizational consultations and program evaluations at institutions such as the University of South Carolina, the University of North Carolina Charlotte, the University of Maryland College Park, Louisiana State University, Fort Valley State University, Rochester, New York Teacher Center, OISE's Department of Sociology and Equity Studies and Education, as well as for nonprofit and civic organizations, including the Ford Foundation's National Center for Urban Partnerships, the National Funding Collaborative for Violence Prevention, and AmeriCorps. Joyce has had numerous research grants from organizations such as the National Urban League, the Spencer Foundation, the Open Society Institute of the Soros Foundation, the Irvine Foundation, the World Council of Churches, and many others. Her publication record is just as impressive. She has six books, one just published by Rutledge entitled Disconscious Praxis and Education for Human Freedom, Through the Years I Keep Toiling, as well as another forthcoming book, dozens of book chapters and refereed articles, as well as a host of research reports and technical publications. In addition to scholarly work, her public, university, professional, and community service record is also impressive. She served as vice president and now is president of the Food First Institute for Food and Policy Development. <clears throat> She is currently serving on the Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education, the California Alliance of African American Educators Policy Board, Women and Life on Earth, and has served on the University Communities Academy Charter School Policy Board in Atlanta, the Haas Center for Public Service at Stanford University, and the Girl Scouts Council of Southeast Louisiana, among other boards of directors and trustee appointments. She has been a tenure and promotion external reviewer for institutions such as George Mason University, Teachers College Columbia, Stanford University, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, OISE, the University of Toronto, the University of Washington, the University of Wisconsin, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and many more. She has also served as an external dissertation reviewer at the University of Pretoria, the University of New Zealand Christ Church, and the University of Auckland. Here at AERA, she has served as the program chair for Division K, chaired the Commission on Research in Black Education, served on the International Relations Committee, Division G's nominating committee, and at least a half dozen other positions. Her professional and university service appointments are too numerous to list in this introduction. Her public and community service work ranges from serving as a convener of the Black Educational Congress's regional forums in Atlanta and Philadelphia and Detroit and Pomona, to serving as an invited delegate to Senegal President Abdul 
a Dublay Wade's seminar on global governance in Dakar. She served as the director of the Songhai Club in the after-school program in Atlanta Public Schools and was a member of the U.S. Senegalese Planning Committees for the Third World Black Arts and Cultural Festival in Senegal. And she served as the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Program Mentor at Princeton University. As far as her editorial work, she serves on the advisory board of Teachers College Press, was co-editor for AERA's Review of Educational Research, as well as serving as an advisor and or reviewer for several handbooks, including the Handbook of African American Education, the Handbook for Research on Multicultural Education, and she reviews for journals such as the Journal of Negro Education, Urban Education, the Journal of Teacher Education, the Canadian Journal of Teacher Education, and again, many, many more. Joyce has received honors and awards from the Federal University of Santo Carlos, Brazil, the Congressional Black Caucus Education Brain Trust, a special Congressional Recognition Award from the 16th California State Assembly, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women of Atlanta, AERA's Distinguished Career Award, among many others. Moreover, the, select, her sele, the selected list of her invited addresses, papers, lectures, and presentations number well over 100. Finally, Joyce has also produced several multimedia programs, including one featuring Sylvia Winter. In conclusion, let me state that this year's theme, Toward Justice, Culture, Language and Heritage, and Education Research and Praxis, reflects not only Joyce's commitment to education and human freedom, it also reflects how she has lived her life working toward justice. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a scholar, colleague, and dear friend, the 2015 AERA president, Joyce Elaine King. Thank you. Well, when she got to that part about the onions, I was ready to just. <laughs> we thought it would work. Um, I'd also like to thank the AERA staff that has made um, this work so much easier and got us to this point. And I have too many friends and colleagues to say thank you for. Some of them have said I might not have any friends left after this meeting. Um, and I'd especially like to thank my colleagues at Georgia State and my students who have been so understanding this year. I want to acknowledge that we are gathered here today uh, in the land of the Potawatomi Nation. Historians tell us that the first permanent resident here in this area was a black man, Jean-Baptiste de Sable. We could say he was an immigrant, a pioneer, a settler who was born in Haiti, and Dussault's father was a Frenchman. His mother had been captured and enslaved as a young girl in the Congo, and she was brought to Haiti and given the name Suzanne. We don't know the name her family gave her, but Dussault gave his mother's name to his own daughter, Suzanne. Dussault was educated in France. He carried his father's name. He immigrated to New Orleans and then came here and established a trading post where he lived with his Potawatomi wife, Kitihawa, in 1778. Kitihawa was the daughter of a Potawatomi chief, Pokagon, and they were married in a traditional ceremony under tribal law. Later, after the defeat of the British, when the American Revolutionary War ended, Dussable and his wife, were married in a Catholic ceremony in 1784, and Kitihawa was given the name Catherine. The first settler award usually goes to Dusable, where he had his cabin that was 40 feet long, and he owned 44 hens, 38 hogs, 30 cattle, two calves, and two mules, Chicago's first tycoon. 
The city of Chicago was chartered in 1837, 19 years after his death in 1818. So we have begun uh, this uh, address, this session, with a memory of African ancestors and uh, of the libation. And I'd like to thank Amira Davis and the drummers who were with her, giving thanks and respectfully honoring our ancestors in an African cultural practice adopted by African Americans. And I'll say more about that um, in the course of my talk. I also want to thank the Native American group from Trickster Art Gallery that will be coming at the end to welcome us all here. I'm going to talk about the three big ideas in this title. And one of my students said, Dr. King, we had to get a, a dictionary to understand the title. Um, the Age of Impunity, Dismantling Epistemological Annihilation, and Morally Engaged Research. I'm going to talk about these ideas in that order. From a theoretical perspective that is informed by the black intellectual tradition that my teacher, Sinclair Drake, introduced to us at Stanford in the 1960s. The scholarship of W.B. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, Carter G. Woodson, Aimé Césaire, C.L.R. James, Walter Rodney, and if you don't know those names, that's homework. Uh, and theoretical and epistemological developments in the discipline of black studies um, and the African theory of knowledge in the intellectual activism of Ida B. Wells, who was from here in Chicago, and Ella Baker. So I'll say more again about that. Later, um, after finishing up at Stanford, I was director of teacher education at Santa Clara, and I served on the curriculum commission for the state of California. So I'm going to start this talk with a little story to illustrate these three big ideas. I protested the conceptual flaws in the history social studies framework. This is back in the 90s, and I've actually got a couple of publications about this. The framework uh, for the history social studies designated California, I'm sorry, uh, the United States as a nation of immigrants. Sylvia Winters theorizing about what race does illuminated my understanding of that epistemological clash. Boaventura de Souza Santos, who spoke yesterday and today, has described what I'm talking about as knowledge born of struggle. So permit me to share this story with you. Uh, during the textbook evaluation week, when teachers come and join the scholars to select books, and California is a textbook adoption state like Texas, I was in a panel with a group of teachers who were reviewing books, and I got called out. Someone sent a message to me. I went out in the hallway, and I found a young Latina teacher crying. She said, Dr. King, I don't know how to handle what's in the textbooks about our ancestors, the Aztecs. I didn't study this history in school. And the books say the Aztecs practice human sacrifice. What am I going to tell my Mexican-American children? What should we tell any of our children about practices that we now regard as inhumane or uncivilized, like slavery, lynching, me lie, or preemptive war on false premises? Do we consider that in our advanced civilization today, mass incarceration could be understood as a form of human sacrifice in this age of impunity that we are living in? <laughs> impunity means exemption from punishment or loss or escape from fines. Within international human rights law, impunity refers to the failure to bring perpetrators of human rights violations to justice. And as such, it constitutes a denial of victims' rights to justice and redress. That is how I am using this term, impunity. I'm framing impunity within the universal human right to education, including the protection of students cultural heritage as a fundamental human right. What is the opposite of impunity? 
Is it necessarily punishment, an eye for an eye? I suggest that the opposite of impunity is inherent cultural racial dignity as a form of accountability. This is in contrast to test-driven accountability. As Asa Hilliard and Barbara Sizemore argued, African American children must be given the opportunity to experience appropriate cultural education, which gives them an intimate knowledge of and which honors and respects the history of our people. We can extend that to other peoples. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. That's the first sentence in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's Article I of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Second, I'm going to explain what epistemological annihilation means as a knowledge problem. This is a form of negation that is related to, but is not the same as cultural annihilation or the destruction of a people's culture. The opposite of epistemological annihilation is racial dignity. Hegemonic knowledge annihilates identity and culture. That is to say, negates a group's identity. At the same time, this hegemonic knowledge necessarily and falsely elevates the identities and worth of others, as Sylvia Winter has argued, in alter ego fashion, justifying oppression with false claims of superiority and disremembered history, whether intentional or not like the way the English language denigrates the idea of blackness, while conceptual whiteness in the English language is always positive. Think about it. We didn't choose those meanings, but they affect us all. We are like a fish in water. As a knowledge problem, epistemological annihilation is also connected to what I have called disconsciousness, an impaired consciousness that is the result of miseducation. Finally, I'll talk about morally engaged research, which can be understood in terms of African epistemology or the African theory of knowledge. For Africans, the focus is not knowledge for knowledge's sake, but knowledge for humanity's sake. The purpose of knowledge is to enhance human flourishing and preserve and promote all other forms of life in the universe. This is why initiation is fundamental. It is critical to train human character so that people can handle knowledge for the benefit of humankind. In the African worldview, knowledge is not merely a right. With knowledge comes responsibility. The one who knows more has more responsibility to care for others and for the world. Knowledge in African epistemology is the path to becoming fully human and humane. Access to African language concepts and other world view uh, concepts are essential, as African philosopher Kwasi Wirudu points out in calling for conceptual decolonization. I thank Annette Henry for sharing Rirudu's words with me. He raised questions of language, culture, and power, noting, by the sheer fact of our institutional education, we are likely to have thought about some, at least, of these concepts and problems, framing them using English or French words or some such colonial language. The problem is that thinking about them in English almost inevitably becomes thinking in English about them. In our case, this means thinking along the lines of conceptual frameworks, which may be significantly different from those embedded in our indigenous languages. By virtue of this phenomenon, we are constantly in danger of involuntarily mental de-Africanization unless we consciously and deliberately resort to our own language and culture. 
I will discuss several examples of morally engaged research and researchers who are co-creating liberating knowledge for the mutual benefit of all with community people and youth. Those who are not usually given the space or opportunity to use their life experience to theorize, philosophize, or analyze reality, but who are in fact epistemically privileged with knowledge of the world that we all live. In the midst of the highest rates of incarceration, joblessness, increasing wealth disparities and poverty, massive school closures that are eroding the fabric of neighborhoods and thus devastating communities, and students and teachers who have become both collateral damage in the regime of high stakes testing. It is not just the survival of public schools, but democracy that is at stake. We have a moral obligation to use our research tools and knowledge for the benefit of the oppressed and for the benefit of those whose consciousness is encapsulated within the current episteme. Over the years, well-meaning advisors have asked me questions like, you're already black and a woman. Why do you want to paint yourself with a questionable methodology like that? Or, do you really need to bring in that African stuff? And this question comes not only from white people, but from black people. In my experience, scholars do not check our identities at the door. Rather, moral considerations or the lack thereof linked to our identities and interests are always already shaping our inquiries. It is a matter of whether we acknowledge that fact or not, or whether we are deceived and have adorned ourselves in what the Latin American sociologist Orlando Falls Border call the mask of objectivity and the wig of neutrality. <laughs> Thus the challenge for the long haul is how do we do our work without unwittingly committing professional suicide as Regent Adelaide Sanford often advises. But these words have resonated with me for a long time. If they come for me in the morning, they will come for you in the afternoon. First, they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. This is a poem written by Professor Martin Niemöller, and it alludes to the cowardice of German intellectuals during the Nazis' rise to power and their subsequent purging of group after group. It might also remind those of us who are old enough to remember the history of the McCarthy era here in the US when intellectuals and artists were hounded and branded for being communists. Today, other labels are thrown around to police our thoughts and our behaviors. If they come for me in the morning, they will surely come for you in the afternoon. Well, who are they? Scholarly and investigative analyses reveal undue influences of wealthy corporate elites in the so-called school reform movement. Consider this headline in the Nation magazine, Nine Billionaires Are About to Remake New York's Public Schools. The article describes hedge fund manager Willie Whitney Tilson's presentation to other potential Ivy League investors at, Harvard, at the Harvard Club in Midtown Manhattan. Speaking about the inequities these children face in the public school system, Tilson emphasizes the high percentage of poor black and Latino children who could not read at a fourth grade level. Despite the role poverty plays, Tilson declares, this is not rocket science. Notice, on my list, there's no spend more money. You get new facilities and smaller classrooms, but nothing changes. Nobody believes anymore, if you give us more money, we'll solve all the problems. 
The proposition that New York's public schools do not need more money violates provisions of the 2006 Campaign for Fiscal Equity court ruling and a statewide resolution to correct the state's inequitable school funding. Something's supposed to come up on the screen. There it is. Okay. Um, so just look at the difference between the blue line and the red line. Instead of adding the $5.5 billion that was to be delivered over four years in order to provide every student in New York State with their constitutional right to a sound basic education, after only two years of more equitable funding, the state of New York actually cut $2.1 billion from public schools and funding has been frozen. Public education is under siege all across the country, Philadelphia, Little Rock, Arkansas, and right here in Chicago. And in New York, in this context, the governor's reform proposal would tie 50% of teacher evaluations to students' dubious test scores based on a controversial practice called value-added modeling. This uh, proposal would drastically weaken teachers' opportunities for tenure, expedite the firing of teachers, make room for 100 more charter schools, and promote state takeover of failing or poor school districts, a tactic that has been used to expand charter school growth without the consent of elected school boards across the country. I'm not saying charter schools are good or bad. What I'm saying is that the process we're using is anti-democratic. All of this is happening with apparent impunity because the United States has not ratified any constitutional provision for education as a fundamental human right, despite Brown versus Board of Education. But it is not happening without resistance from organized groups like ICOPE in New York, the Independent Commission of Public Education, the growing opt-out of testing movement, and students who have been organizing. Grassroots groups are not only resisting, they are expanding their analyses beyond a focus on their own local community and looking beyond the limitations of U.S. law to international humanitarian standards for redress and repair. So I'm going to talk about impunity in relation to international human humanitarian law. I'm going to try to speed up. I've got a lot to say. I was struck by the one sentence in this article about the nine billionaires. No such children nor their parents seem to have been invited to the presentation in Midtown Manhattan. One example of the kind of resistance being organized nationally is the Journey for Justice Alliance of grassroots youth and parent-led organizations in 21 cities. The Journey for Justice Alliance website states, we are organizing in our neighborhoods, in our cities, and nationally for an equitable and just education system based on a belief in the potential of all children and the rights of parents, youth, and communities to participate in all aspects of planning and decision making. Their website continues, the policies of the last 15 years driven more by private interest than by concern for our children's education are devastating our neighborhoods and our democratic rights. Only by organizing locally and coming together nationally will we build the power we need to change local, state, and federal policy and win back our public schools. And I'm saying that morally engaged research can join with these local efforts and national and international efforts to organize. The Journey for Justice Alliance has produced a detailed research report, which you can find online, Death by a Thousand Cuts, that demonstrates how racism and school closures are sabotaging public schools. Here is an example of their, well, I'm not going to show this, I don't have time, but in the report, there is a summary of research on and lived experience with school closures and the expansion of charter schools. A very in-depth analysis coming from the bottom up, coming from the community. And um, that report also includes a set of six principles 
from the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I have to go very quickly through this. One principle is based on individual rights. Another is concerns the aims of education. Education is directed toward the development of each child's personality and full potential. Dignity, equity, non-discrimination, and participation. And these principles come from the UN Declaration as well as other conventions the right of students, parents, and communities to participate in decisions that affect their schools and the right to an education. But because the U.S. Constitution, as I said earlier, has not, no provision for education as a fundamental human right, there's really no legal framework to independently adjudicate alleged breaches of international human rights law regarding education or to compensate victims when those internationally agreed upon standards are not met with respect to education. The J4J Alliance calls for a set of six actions, and action five is the one that I want to focus on for a moment. The international um, human, humanitarian law that they are drawing upon suggests this action. The White House Domestic Policy Council, United Nations, and Permanent Court of International Justice should participate in a grassroots impact tour of the communities affected by mass school closure to hear from students, parents, educators, and community members and witness community-wide effects. Such an internationalization of the struggle for justice for African Americans and Latino Americans is in this instance, uh, to defend public education, is not without precedent. Following an aborted NAACP petition initiative for which W.E.B. Du Bois was employed as the lead researcher four years earlier, in 1951, the Civil Rights Congress submitted a petition entitled, We Charge Genocide to the United Nations for Relief from a Crime of the United States Against the Negro People. Petitions were delivered simultaneously in New York and Paris. The leadership of this initiative included Paul Robeson. How many of you studied Paul Robeson in school? And William Patterson, National Executive Secretary of the CRC. The petitioners researched and documented racial killing and the evidence of other human rights abuses, including institutionalized oppression in health, housing, and police persecution. This is 1951. In addition, the petition cited denial of education as a matter of public policy contributes to genocide by forcing Negroes into dangerous industry and poorly paid work, by systematically reducing their income and depriving them of decent housing, medical care, food, and clothing. Last year, from right here in Chicago, the Black Youth Project, an international, intergenerational, grassroots activist group, organized a campaign to equip individuals across Chicago with information, resources, and tools to more proactively police the police. They called this campaign, We Charge Genocide, as well. This group compiled research, and delegates of youth activists delivered their report to the UN Commission Against Torture at The Hague. The report titled Police Violence Against Chicago's Youth of Color is available online and it reveals evidence of police torture. So my point is that what we're calling for, what I'm calling for is going on. We just often haven't heard about it. Mexican Americans have also reached across the border for support from the Mexican government. In the book, Steel Barrio, The Great Mexican Migration to the South Side of Chicago, 1915 to 1940, Michael Jimenez emphasizes the importance of prominent Chicago-based Mexican hometown associations like Casa Michoacan that work like mutual aid societies. These associations maintain connections with and contributed to development projects with their communities of origin. The author recalls that in the 1930s and 40s, Mexican immigrants 
sought support from the Mexican consul against harassment and discrimination in the interwar years, not unlike African American efforts to internationalize the civil rights struggle during the same period. And Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings mentioned the Lemon Grove incident in California in an earlier period. Those Mexican American parents also consulted with Mexican government officials. And after the huge immigration protest rallies that took place in Chicago in LA in 2006, Chicago community leaders visited Mexico City to seek support from the Mexican government. Missing from the Journey for Justice call for alliance for the UN and the World Court to witness the effects of school closures on children and their communities, however, is any reference to international humanitarian law that protects cultural rights and prohibits cultural annihilation or genocide. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the most widely accepted human rights treaty in history, which has been ratified by every nation except the United States and Somalia, stresses the cultural rights of ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities and indigenous children. Article 30 says, a child belonging to such a minority or who is indigenous shall not be denied the right in community with other members of his or her group to enjoy his or her own culture, to profess and practice his or her own right to religion, or to use his or her own language. Cultural genocide was initially proposed as a part of the UN Declaration and politics prevented it from being accepted. Other more recent treaties like the Council of Europe's Framework Convention for the Protection of Minorities contains anti-assimilation language and creates express obligations to respect cultural diversity. Likewise, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights asserts the right of all people to education and the right to their economic, social, and cultural development with regard to their freedom and identity. January 2015 launched the International Decade for People of African Descent, which is intended to recognize and honor people of African descent for their political, cultural, and educational spiritual contributions to the world and to address the historical and continuous discrimination and racism faced by people of African descent. This is an opportunity to bring the condition, conditions of African people to the UN. Indigenous people have been mobilizing throughout the Americas and have brought cultural genocide, indigenous rights violations, and cultural preservation issues to the forefront of international human rights law. I'm going to um, share with you now a short video clip about um, navigation in Melanesia, which will show an example of epistemological annihilation. And I'd like to present this example as one that also indicates to us what can happen when researchers join with community people to respect culture. Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs> I carried the first people to these islands. You are the first people we sailed to these islands. Through oceans and heavens. Oceans all and rising heavens. and setting stars. See the stars. With and against winds and currents. Praying for a good boy. To spirits we pray. I 
I studied in Hawaii and California only to discover that the biggest truths are found in my own backyard. I'm from a part of the Pacific misnamed Micronesia, which means tiny islands. And yet, us little people have a tradition of traveling that allowed us to traverse the world's biggest body of water long before others even left sight of their own shores. Our ancestors accomplished great voyages through technologies of canoe design, such as the outrigger that provided balance and stability, or hulls that applied the aerodynamic principles of lift now used in airplane wings. The ancient ones amassed an incredible knowledge of stars and clouds, of waves and ocean currents, of the movement of sea creatures, and they prayed to spirits who guided their voyages. When I returned home, I began to study our seafaring traditions because the canoe is the foundation of our heritage. For me, a Micronesian academic, the canoe is more than a foundation. It is a metaphor for a history of island and islander travel. In my studies, I focused on two particular islands, Polawat in the Central Carolines and Guam in the Marianas, where I live. The Polawatis today are famous because they continue to carve and sail canoes using the old methods, while the Chamorros were famous in the past for having the fastest and the most beautiful canoes in the world. Like other Micronesian islanders, the Polawatis and the Chamorros had maintained contact long before the arrival and the settlements of foreigners. At the outset of colonial rule, these ties were severed. Today, a new generation of Polawatis and Chamorros reconnect the old links in an effort to preserve ancient traditions. In modern times, ancient traditions continue to explore new horizons. When I first became interested in new culture, I was attending a college in, in Colorado at a small uh, state college in Gunnison. And my father would send me glimpses magazines from Guam. One of the glimpses that he sent me was on the canoes of Pulawat. So after I read that, I told myself I'm basically going to go back home and you know find out about this canoe culture on Guam and see if there were any canoe builders or master canoe builders left here. When I returned, I was introduced to Tinsegundo Blas, uh, one of the last active master canoe builders at that time. After having met Segundo, I was trying to figure out a way that we could work together and build a canoe that he, the types of canoes that he built. So um, then I would ask him questions. How long do you think it would take to build this size canoe? I looked around for a tree that I thought would be suitable for the canoe we talked about, and I told him the dimensions, and he said, well, it'll probably take us about three months to build this canoe. When we first started working, I knew that there was some value in recording this. So I bought my first camera and immediately started taking pictures of everything. I would tell myself every hour, I'm going to take up one picture. And over a period of time, you could actually see through a series of photographs what was being done. And the role of documenting was important because it's difficult to tell children about something they can't see. And if they can see something, you know, they might, they might become interested. So it's a valuable tool. The obvious reasons why we are lacking so much of our our culture, our seafaring culture here, is because of the, the Spanish, the conflict between the Spanish and the, the Chamorros at the time, the canoe and, and the means of getting around and communicating with other islands and getting large groups of people together was a threat to the Spanish, so they made a concerted effort to destroy that part of the culture. So what this documentary talks about is the knowledge that the traditional seafaring uh, people have, their epistemology, um, what they know about navigation and how they know without the use of scientific instruments like the compass or GPS. It is recorded in their memory, their songs, and the design of their outrigger canoes. 
The scholar says the ancient ones amassed an incredible knowledge of stars, clouds, and waves, and ocean currents about the movements of sea creatures, and they prayed to the spirits who guided their voyages. When I served on the Curriculum Commission, we were reviewing science textbooks for adoption, and I suggested that this knowledge about seafaring navigation could be included in the science textbooks. They said, you can't put that in a science textbook. That's religion. I say epistemological annihilation. So I'm going to skip around just a little bit. Um, the other aspect of epistemological annihilation that I wanted to illustrate is the sort of duality, the, the two sides. This is what happens to the culture um, of indigenous people, but what happens to the oppressor group, the privileged group? What happens is their humanity is attenuated, is short-circuited, is cut off. Um, when I also served, during the time that I was on the Curriculum Commission, a reporter in Palo Alto, the upscale community, asked a teacher there, well, what do you think about the conflict with these textbooks? She said, well, we don't have any of those children in our classroom, so it really isn't uh, a problem for us. So that led me to this concept of disconscious racism, an uncritical habit of mind that suggests uh, justification of inequity and exploitation by accepting the existing order of things as given. It's not an absence of consciousness, but an impaired consciousness. And we're still dealing with this conflict over knowledge, this epistemological battle. If you think about what's happening in Tucson, Arizona, with the banning of the Mexican American Studies program. So in January, two students from that program actually uh, sued the state of Arizona, Maya Arce and Karina Aliza Lopez filed a lawsuit that was heard by the ninth U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And their attorney pointed out that a study in the American Educational Research Journal concluded that that curriculum boosted student achievement. You can actually see the court case online. It was on C-SPAN and it's on YouTube. So the judges are talking to the, uh, the attorney for the state of Arizona and the judge says, well, um, I don't understand the problem because they've chosen to ignore the America's, uh, the amicus brief that the NEA produced in support of this case. And that amicus brief records lots of evidence, social science evidence, that shows that a positive racial ethnic identity increases student achievement. The brief further said, the culturally relevant content and teaching methods of ethnic studies programs are meant to address and counteract some of the broad social and economic forces that lead minorities' educational achie to achievement gaps. So the judge asked whether a hypothetical course in Chinese history in San Francisco would violate Arizona's law because Chinese students interested in studying their heritage might take it. Um, the attorney said yes, it might. So then the judge asked, well, uh, isn't it important for students to achieve well? And if, uh, if their uh, positive identity is a problem, how, what, what is wrong with that? The attorney said, well, in this case, test scores are irrelevant because the issue is that the state of Arizona has the right to determine the curriculum. The judge, I think, was rather incredulous at that moment. So um, I want to uh, come to a close. The epistemological foundations of the indigenous science of the Micronesian people has a lot in common with Native American science and African epistemology as well. And contrary to what many people believe, the lives of African Americans continue to be shaped by and informed by African epistemology. 
People and scholars mistakenly believe that African Americans have no distinct cultural heritage intact as a foundation for excellence and resilience. I'd like to give an example of how African thought informs our behavior and worldviews. And this comes from, with her permission, something that Professor Joy Ann Williamson Lott shared with me after the AERA Council visited a unique museum outside of New Orleans, a slave museum. Uh, and I'm quoting from a note with her permission. As you know, she writes, I wasn't thrilled about visiting a plantation. With all my travels in the South, I have studiously avoided visiting one. I've heard stories of sugar-coated realities, people dressed in period costume, et cetera. But when you told me we'd visit one in Louisiana, I trusted that you wouldn't put any of us through that. I wasn't disappointed. If I had to visit a plantation, that was one to visit. I had no idea a place like that existed, one that portrayed the reality from the African-American perspective. It was a very emotional experience for me. It's impossible for me to think about slavery as an academic experience. It's deeply personal. That part felt honored in that place. I was able to tell those spirits, I will do them proud and make sure their hardship, love, and laughter won't be forgotten. Now I'm gonna share with you something from my own family tradition. This is my mother speaking uh, during an interview that we did with her before she passed away, and that's her and my granddaughter, Jordan. Uh, this is an example of African epistemology in my own family. And my mother's telling us a story that I've heard many times about what happened with her grandmother I'm going to just summarize in case her voice isn't strong enough for you to get every word. She's talking about going fishing with her grandmother and walking ahead of her grandmother and her grandmother looking at her foot tracks in the sand and what she tells her about her life based upon her reading of the foot tracks in the sand. Children during that time, during the weekday, they did not wear their shoes. They would just be barefoot. And also with grandmothers and elders, you become a favorite because you obeyed them and you did nice things for them, such as ironing, uh, washing their aprons. Older ladies wore the great white apron with lots of lace on it. Lace across the bottom and everywhere. And you became a favorite. And when she's, whatever she's going to do, whether it's cooking or fishing or, or visiting, she would say, come on, baby, we're ready to go. We're going to tell you where, where we're going, what we're going to do. We're going fishing. And uh, she would pack a lunch. She would have biscuits and jelly and sometimes butter, not always butter. And she would pack that in a cloth bag. We would ordinarily pack it in a, in a paper bag. But she would pack it. We didn't have paper bag that much. When somebody brought something from the store, the paper bag was usually uh, uh, used up or torn or wasn't in good shape to travel anymore after one trip. <laughs> and uh, after being with your grandmother so often, and you knew 
exactly her habits and what she wanted and you would travel you you would walk real close to her ahead of her walking ahead of her and traveling around the neighborhood in walking distance was sand sandy land so you were just ha happy entertaining yourself with little words and songs and jumping and you, you were just a happy child so my grandmother would we would slow down and and she would put her hand on top of my head and she say you you you're going to be, be something you but you're going to really amount to something but i won't be here that's what she said i won't be here but you're going to amount to something i can tell by the track in the sand she would look at my foot track in the sand and I thought, oh, that's so silly. Oh, <laughs> that's nothing. But she was able to sum up my life, my success, in my track, in the sand. And I, I didn't forget that, but I ignored it at the time. I thought, oh, shit. That's nothing. I was about seven or eight. This right to put her hand on my head. And uh, by us being close, and I, I loved her very much. And I was very close to her. And Whatever she said, I, I kind of thought it was law, and yet I, I shoved it off, you know, so shook. and she died when I was about 13. Uh, I, I remembered all those times that we were together. And Thank you, Constantly. Thank you for your patience. Being a friend, uh, someone that you love and you are with all the time, you love them and you want to make them happy. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to bring this to a close. I had a long list of uh, examples of research, but I think I'm going to save that for the journal article and just um, tell you that uh, morally engaged research is more in my mind than community based research, than community participation, because there is an ethos of justice built in. Not just participation, but participation for what purpose? And I'd like to share a quote from Du Bois, which I think encapsulates this for me. Du Bois saw education to be truly education, and I would add research, um, as partisan, and given the realities of the social order, fundamentally subversive. This was written by Herbert Apdecker, his biographer, who was a white radical historian in his own right. Uh, Apdecker continues, specifically in this connection, Du Bois wrote as a black man in the United States. In this sense, he was concerned in the first place with the education of his people in the United States and that education as part of the process of the liberation of his people. Thus, his writing on education, as on everything else, has a kind of national consciousness, a specific motivation while directed toward his people at the same time and therefore was meant to serve all humanity. 
And this is what I wrote in 1995 in James Banks' Handbook of Multicultural Education about this position that Du Bois was staking out. This commitment to uplifting humanity by struggling to transform the United States into a socially just society while valorizing African American culture and autonomy is an important dimension of the tradition of black studies and African American social thought. And finally, Du Bois said, I am not fighting to settle the question of racial equality in America by getting rid of black folk. Rather, his commitment was to the possibility of black folk and our cultural patterns existing in America without discrimination and on terms of equality. This requires the preservation of African American history and culture, Du Bois wrote, as a valuable contribution to modern civilization as it was to medieval and ancient civilization. Du Bois's position is co consistent with education and research approaches that center students in their own cultural heritage as a foundation for teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a surprise. Man. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Georgia State University's Department of Educational Policy Studies, we wanted to honor your presidency of AERA. As educational researchers, we wanted to thank you for bringing the focus of social justice to the conference this year. And we also wanted to thank you for reminding us of our responsibilities to youth and advancing their communities by introducing the revolutionary idea of bringing youth researchers and organizing a youth tribunal in this space. We We are honored to work with you and to learn from the example that your scholarship and service provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sherelle is a recent graduate of Georgia State College of Education, and she's looking for work. <laughs> So now I have the pleasure of calling next year's president of AERA, Dr. Jeannie Oakes, to come and accept the gavel. I've been told that the uh, Native American uh, trickster gallery folks are here. Is that true? Hi, is that Joe? Come on. How are you? Can you tell us what we're going to experience? I will. And this is actually a reversal. They should have come at the beginning, but we're going to do our welcome now. <laughs> Let me Joe, offer you a, a little bit of tobacco in your left hand. My left hand. Okay. We're going to do this because after we welcome all the dancers in for you, okay. um, we use tobacco to pray. Okay. And we do the left hand. So you want to tell us what we're I will. Say? So good evening and uh, bonjour, which is uh, welcome in Ojibwe. My name is Joe Podlasek. Um, to the creator, my name is Muskadi Bijigi, uh, which is Standing Buffalo. Um, being in an urban area, I was named spiritually 
first by an elder of the Lakota uh, people who was a real educator for me. And then it was later translated in Ojibwe um, by my medicine man. <coughs> so that's how my name came to be. Um, I want to thank you all for being part of making change. Important work, um, Dr. Joyce King and your team, uh, for all the work that you do because that education and those policy settings, that's critical work. Um, we need to be very strong about our culture. Um, a new connection from those that open from the African community uh, upon their leaving because we have so much in common traditionally. If we take the time to look at our traditional values, we're connected that way in so many ways. And the use of the water was a very moving and emotional part for us um, today too. Um, but for right now, I wanted to uh, introduce Mr. Dave Spencer, who's from the Navajo and Choctaw Nations. He's gonna sing some songs for us. We're gonna bring in our dancers to celebrate um, this uh, amazing day and um, the year that has been provided to us by Miss King. Uh, so let's do that. And then uh, we're gonna offer up a little prayer. I'll talk about the dancers real briefly um, after they come in, and then we're gonna do a special song for you. Thank you, Dave, for that beautiful song. Uh, I'll quickly explain what you just had the uh, uh, amazing
amazing opportunity to witness. We got to start with our drum. The drum is the heartbeat of who we are. The heartbeat, um, um, the drum years ago was given to us by the women um, because the women are held in high esteem and the only ones that can create life in that heartbeat. So to create balance in life, they gave, gifted us this drum. Um, so that's always the heartbeat of who we are and life is about balance and finding good things. Um, we have the opportunity for the Francisco family to join us. Um, Paula and her children. And they are in the, um, the, the, the young ladies there are in the jingle dress, which is our medicine dress. Um, so that's sharing good, good feelings today. Um, the, the cones, the shush shush sound is sharing medicine. Um, and that's in Ojibwe style. Um, the young men um, are in traditional and grass dance. Um, traditional is the oldest form of dance in North America. Um, there's also a woman's version of that. And the grass dance is uh, uh, more modern. It's only about 80 years old um, style of dance that has been incorporated by our, our culture uh, to help an injured child is how that was actually formed. There's a long story, but I know I'm short on time. Um, I do wanted to offer a prayer in closing. Um, so if we could all take a moment um, and go to the creator, to your God, however you pray, um, and to whoever you pray to, that higher power. We ask that you um, bring us together, remembering the basic things in life, Mother Earth, Father Sky, the water, our two-legged, our four-legged, our winged animals, that uh, we all come together in unity. Um, those are the essentials that everything comes from. Our culture, our people all depend on um, those elements. As we continue to grow and look upon each other, um, that we strengthen and better understand and care for each other and for those elements. Um, this room and this movement has a lot of power to move that in a good and powerful way. Um, there's a lot of educated people here that can set policies to help those values. Please look over them and continue to guide them in a good way so this, uh, this work can continue to blend this education of culture um, together with policy. So I ask you, um, look over us for another year and ho ho, thank you. So before the, before the prayer, um, I offered uh, Ms. Dr. King uh, some tobacco. For us, that is a way of saying thank you. Um, it's an old way that has come from generations um, and sharing that and we like to keep that alive everywhere we go. And again, we share it from left hand to left hand, which is closest to your heart. So when you give a gift of tobacco or of Mother Earth, things that have grown from her, it's, it's with all of our heart we say thank you. Um, a lot of times that's, that's all it takes to ask somebody to do something. Um, it's about a gift, not what the gift is. It wasn't about bringing a bag of tobacco. Um, it, was, it was about the gift and the intent. Um, it's not the quantity. Um, it's about the, what you feel here and what you share. And as long as that continues, um, which I think it will in this room, I've been you know, waiting and spending some time here and talking to people and there's some really great people here. Um, so we would like to share a thank you song um, in our way. So if we could all stand for this, I'd appreciate that. And this is for uh, Dr. King.
Thank you all. Okay, okay. So in your work and in your studies moving forward, please keep in mind the first people of these lands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We have a reception for you outside. Thank you for coming and for being so wonderful.